North Korean furry propaganda cartoons. Huh? Yes, that's an actual statement that is 100% true. I, okay, yeah, I, I know, I, I know, I've talked about this before. But that was like five years ago, and only a handful of the 32 episodes were translated at the time. So, just like, pretend you never saw it, okay? There you go! A clean slate! This video is going to be much better, because now I know what's actually happening in the show. And I got to check out another anthro cartoon from North Korea. Oh yeah. For those of us who have an unhealthy infatuation about anthropomorphic propaganda cartoons from an isolated totalitarian regime, oh, we're eating good tonight. <laughs> This video is really the topic trifecta for me. One, my morbid curiosity about North Korea and its people. Two, my morbid curiosity about propaganda cartoons. And three, you guessed it, anthropomorphic characters. Put it all together, and you got yourself an animation studio that overworks and underpays its artist, has economic sanctions on it, looks to avoid said sanctions by utilizing front companies, to avoid detection, and of course preaches the agenda of North Korea unity and military power, via anthropomorphic squirrels kicking the asses of rats, weasels, and wolves, who are totally not symbolic of other countries. <laughs> I mean, where would you get an idea like that? <laughs> So, in this video, we're going to explore the bizarre world of North Korean anthro cartoons. Who made them, what they're exactly about, what they're trying to accomplish, and how North Korea utilizes anthropomorphism in combination with propaganda to brainwash the people of its country. Like, no joke, Squirrel and Hedgehog are like the Mickey Mouse and Bugs Bunny of North Korea, while Clever Raccoon Dog here is the sum of all my fears. It is legit wild that all of this comes from a government that is nicknamed the Hermit Kingdom, one that is notoriously known for letting very little in and out of the country, except for missiles flying into the ocean. I guess answer storytelling is just that universal when it comes to humanity, and I sincerely mean that. No one can escape it. Except for me, of course. I've been dodging it for years. It will never get me. <laughs> Fuck. Well, it was only a matter of time. The history of North Korean animation is, unsurprisingly, attached to the hip of North Korea itself. To prevent this video from snowballing into a rabbit hole of an unrelated topic, I'm going to stay focused on the core points of North Korea's past, and how it has led to the creation of these anthropomorphic propaganda cartoons. Yes, this history does matter. In the early 1900s, Japan essentially colonized a big chunk of the Korean peninsula and ruled over the Korean people with an iron fist. This went on for like 35 years. During World War II, though, a lot of Korean men were sent to the front lines to fight for the Japanese against the Allies, while the Korean women at home were sexually assaulted on the daily by Japanese soldiers. In 1945, the Japanese surrendered, and the Soviet Union and the Americans split up Korea into two zones along a border called the 38th Parallel. After years of Japanese oppression, the Koreans were finally free and things were going to get better, right? Thank you, Titan has freed us. Oh, I wouldn't say free, more like under new management. <laughs> the Korean War started in 1950 and was somewhat of a proxy war between the communist North, backed by the Soviet Union and China, versus the capitalistic Republic and the South, backed by the US and its allies. After three years of battle and millions of casualties, the war came to an unnerving conclusion, with both sides essentially intact. Following the war, North Korea, also known as the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, adopted the ideology of Juche, aka self-reliance. And for the next few decades, the North Korean people saw genuine improvements in their country, both for its military and its economy. And all of this was done via domestic means. And part of that would include animation. Enter Scientific Educational Korea, aka SEK Studio, 
Owned by the North Korean state and launched in 1957, SEK Studio went right to work on making animated shorts and cartoons that promoted the ideologies of its government. Be self-reliant. The army is cool. And screw the Americans. Uh, specifically with sharp pencils if you can. SEK released a variety of animated shorts, but most of them are hard to track down or are just simply lost media at this point. But it had two successful Anthro series. Clever Raccoon Dog in 1987, and Squirrel and Hedgehog in 1977. Each respective series is a mixed bag when it comes to consistency, especially Squirrel and Hedgehog. They would drop episodes and then just disappear for years. Apparently, the first episode was a standalone pilot, but the North Koreans loved it so much that the pilot was made into a full-blown series. In lockstep with the North Korean government's ideologies, both shows include themes, lessons, and messages to impart to viewers. For Clever Raccoon Dog, it was more educational and about children being intellectually and physically healthy. You know, sports and, and doing your math homework. For Squirrel and Hedgehog, it was about how this drunk bear is not defending the squirrels from the aggressive mice and weasels anymore, and that they need to arm up ASAP and use their self-reliance, camaraderie, and big-ass tanks to destroy any foe who dares to invade their precious home. Huh, I wonder what inspired them to create that story. <laughs> Propaganda has been used all throughout recorded human history, and even Americans have thrown some low blows in order to sway the minds of its citizens. Private snafu? Oh my god. And you folks do not want to know what Bugs Bunny was up to during World War II. So, considering the traumatic and bloody past of the North Korean people, especially when it comes to the Japanese and Americans, well, I can at least understand where their resentment comes from and why it's reflected in Squirrel and Hedgehog. They never want to be bothered again, and we can totally see that in their animated propaganda. Now, despite North Korea's adamant stance when it comes to self-reliance, they've made exceptions when it comes to cultivating their animation industry. In the 1980s, SEK Studio started to pick up clients and did contract work for places like Russia, China, France, Spain, and Italy. They even sent their own animators to Italy and France to improve their own skills and went a step further by inviting foreign animators into North Korea itself in order to teach their artist. Now, it can be argued that this path was pursued because North Korea was desperate for cash flow during the 1980s and hoped to win over foreign investors with cheap labor. But it's also entirely possible that the North Koreans themselves wanted to be better animators so that they can continue pushing their own animated propaganda. And on top of that, Kim Jong-il, the North Korean leader at the time, was a huge film buff. And North Korea bolstered a surprisingly robust entertainment industry. Like, get this. They even kidnapped South Koreans during the 80s in order to force them to make a North Korean version of Godzilla called Pulgasari. <laughs> what the actual hell? Yeah. SEK would continue to collaborate with other countries during the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. Hell, even some of the Simpsons movie, and even an episode of Avatar The Last Airbender was outsourced to SCK Studio. In 1998, a policy was initiated by South Korea called the Sunshine Policy, and it was an attempt to patch up relationships between North and South via economic collaboration. North Korea agreed to these terms. From 2003 to 2005, both countries worked on a South Korean show called Hororo the Little Penguin, and also on a movie called Empress Chung, which was based on a shared Korean folklore. The movie was released in 2005 in both countries and was this extremely rare case of the two sides working together in harmony. But in 2006, tensions went nuclear, literally. North Korea announced in October of 2006 that they successfully conducted their first nuclear test and the international community went ballistic. Probably the wrong word to use, right? The North Korean government violated the Non-Proliferation Treaty from 1995, and South Korea noped right out of the Sunshine Policy by 2008. Honestly, it is truly a shame, and I mean that. 
No doubt, there is plenty of baggage when it comes to North Korea and the skeletons in its closet. But the collaborative efforts of the Sunshine Policy actually succeeded for a moment. Now, was this driven by altruistic intentions by the North Koreans? Who can say? Doubtful, but when it comes to the long and painful history of the Korean Peninsula, we gotta take our wins when we can, because they are few and far between. At the moment, SCK Studio still endures to this day, and I'm very certain that they took what they learned from their international colleagues and funneled it right back into their own work. Cell animation? Nah, we using Toon Boom now. Though it should be said that SEK still tries to entertain contracts from outside companies. Mondo World is probably the biggest offender of all, and has even acquired the rights to localize and distribute Clever Raccoon Dog and Squirrel and Hedgehog. Though the violence has been heavily toned down, and of course, as is tradition with Mondo, it features some of the most bizarre dubbing I've ever heard. They even got the guy who voiced Eggman in Sonic X, Mike Pollock, to be the voice of the drunk bear in the pilot episode of Squirrel and Hedgehog. I can sing and dance the trot, but also have the strength of two. Uh, what's this? A boulder on my dance floor? <laughs> oh! As of right now, North Korea is more concerned in making MLG edits announcing their new missiles than making actual cartoons. I'm not joking. <laughs> but according to sources, SEK Studio still continues to produce content for customers in China plus an assortment of other questionable international companies. Companies who are in trouble for trying to avoid sanctions. They want to use that cheap labor in North Korea, and they do this by setting up front companies in order to wire money back and forth to one another and avoid detection. It is an absolute shit show. Ultimately, the bizarre and tragic history of North Korea carries overwhelming weight when it comes to its people, its government, and its media. It's no wonder why something like Squirrel and Hedgehog exist, when one considers the country's turbulent past. These cartoons are indicative of their culture, and are truly unique for all the wrong reasons. But that's not gonna stop me from watching them. Actually, you'd be surprised. I first went into Squirrel and Hedgehog like five years ago with like, no context, because there are only a handful of episodes available in English. But now I have too much context. Like, the plot for this show is downright chaos and is the kid cartoon equivalent of a military soap opera. And all of this is accomplished through cute little anthro characters who will shoot you with a gun while surfing on a car. There are two primary furry character cartoons in North Korea, Clever Raccoon Dog and Squirrel and Hedgehog. When I first watched Squirrel and Hedgehog years ago, I did not know about Clever Raccoon Dog, so of course my morbidly curious ass had to know more. I mean, do we have another anthropropaganda cartoon on our hands? An expanded North Korean furry cartoon universe, perhaps? Despite the occasional chaotic nature of Clever Raccoon Dog, it's not nearly as interesting both in premise and production as Squirrel and Hedgehog. It is dun 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 educational programming. Ugh, yeah. Just a, a bear, a squirrel, a cute sheep girl side character, and a clever raccoon dog learning about science and safety and ugh, math. This is truly the most abhorrent war crime that North Korea has ever committed. There's even an episode about avoiding highway bandits uh, who pretend to be pedestrians in distress and how you can get back at them by using math to measure the lift of a tarp because you can use that tarp to precariously float into the propeller of the attack helicopter of the bad guys and then blow it up and then cheer when they die in a violent death. 
The show itself has been running since 1987 and has over 70 episodes. Just like Squirrel and Hedgehog, it too has had random batches of releases that include animation changes throughout the years. Hand-drawn cell animation to Doom Boom. I watched a good chunk of episodes, but the one that stands out to me the most is episode 69. Yeah, how appropriate, right? Nice. Uh, the trio of friends are fishing with a crab robot, and a fox girl shows up. And yeah, let's just say that North Korea can't escape the questionable furry vortex either. I watched this particular episode on my Twitch with my friend Rishi, and I feel that our reactions are the best way to represent our genuine thoughts about Clever Raccoon Dog. Enjoy. So the synopsis is Raccoon Dog and his friends are in North Korea. <laughs> Over there. <laughs> <laughs> Saber, are you That's reviewing a, a North Korean furry cartoon? My face. Yeah. Probably just Fox. This looks like a cartoon where the characters would just be named. Right, right. Whatever animal they are. It's like, oh, Fox. it's Fox. Oh, it's Bear. They did it. They located the fish. Oh, God. Don't do that face. I don't know. Girls have eyelashes. Guys have eyebrows. Let me back my fish drone. It's crab. You're not gonna get that far with the crab. Okay, here we go. The infamous pinch. Ah! What? Hold on. Weird. The, nipple, the nipple pinch. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that little yeah is so unnecessary, but it, it, it enhances it so much. I mean, she just seemed like she wanted fish earlier. She's hungry. She's a hungry girl. I'll be real, her design's not terrible. No, it's appealing. There's actually a visual style to North Korean cartoons. That's the wild thing to me. How, how recent is this? When did it's this like come five, out? like five years ago, I believe, but still, like... All right, so I mentioned it before. I need, I need to verify this 100%, but I'm pretty sure that North Korea actually has South Korean animators come up to a neutral zone that's agreed upon where they help to animate the show. Not completely, but I think some like, I guess, key people who are like helping with storyboards and whatnot. I'm sorry, I looked away. Was she giving him a back rub? Look at his rib cage sticking out. Go to the rib cage, doctor. Oh yeah, like dull gelatinous looking. Oh, a bit froze. Okay, we're good. She's tickling him. Well, maybe that's why she was getting fish. Maybe she's like, I need to feed him. Maybe. I like her ascot. <laughs> Daddy. <laughs> Whenever it is with a woman, it automatically becomes sexual. No, you're, you're absolutely right. That's a very, very good point. Who's flying the plane? <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's on autopilot. Uh, it's a good thing I brought rocks. They think they can get away. I don't think so. I'll drop more rocks on them. Let's get them! Whoa, she's strong as fuck! She has been a say. She's pretty fucking strong. <laughs> yes! Get it! <laughs> Dude, she got it! What if they put a bomb in there? Cartoon face. Dude, she's falling out. Oh, to wall! I'm Jesus. sorry! Did he just. Fucking punch her in the face! <laughs> Did he stop flying to punch her in the face? Dude, he went he's like so far away from her. How did he like? <laughs> did he reach over? And <laughs> punch he went like ten feet out of the cockpit to punch her face. He like jumped out of the plane. <laughs> Wait, it's close now. What the fuck? You know, they're like close. What the hell? The, the plane God. changed dimensions. Uh, consistency. <laughs> hey! <gasps> oh no, direct hit. So I imagine they tricked them into saying your plane can't even fly and they're flying now. Look out. Champion. <laughs> I can throw the apple. I can throw it at my friend. Let's fuck his ass. Let's get him. Come on, raccoon, clever raccoon dog. Whoa! Dude! Oh my god, no way. You got an, 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 an accessory in my plane. Because you never know. And they said I was a fool for requesting the ax 
axe head on the tip of my plane. <laughs> okay, what's gonna happen? He's gonna break the glass and then hit him? It's gonna bounce off the glass. Yo! Ow, it's an apple. Ah! Oh my god, he's gonna get glass <laughs> in his face. The growling sound effect. <laughs> what? A Windows 95 screensavers is their outro. Dude, you're right. That's exactly what it looks like. Overall, Clever Raccoon Dog channels the chaotic peaks, but also the boring valleys of SCK Studio and their writing. The show isn't nearly as interesting as Squirrel and Hedgehog, but it has its moments. Bizarre, tonally questionable moments, and all to the glory of anthropomorphism. There's also the Mondo World dub of the show called Little Bear. Nope, not that one. Ah, yes, that one. And the voice acting is terrible and hilarious. Yay, I got a fire started before you two! <laughs> but that brings us back to the main star of SCK Studio and the primary topic of this video, Squirrel and Hedgehog. A beloved series in North Korea that is plastered all over their country. It is truly a hit for both North Korean adults and children alike. And it perfectly summarizes their sentiment about their military first policy and indoctrinating their youth when it comes to war. If you don't have the Squirrel and Hedgehog backpack, are you really a fan at all? It's funny, because I feel that there are Americans and other international viewers who are just as hyped about Squirrel and Hedgehog, if not more so, as the North Koreans. But, you know, for other reasons. It's probably really awkward at the Squirrel and Hedgehog convention, you know? Hey, I love this show. Hey, I love this show. North Korea's like, wait, why do you like this show? Oh, we have our reasons. So unlike my previous video about Squirrel and Hedgehog, I now have context about the series since it's fully subbed now. By the way, a big shout out to the small but passionate fandom that surrounds this show. And props to DP RK Squirrels in particular for getting the DVD, translating into English, getting the information about the show, and just generally being a wonderful source of, of, of assistance for this video. Thank you so much. They definitely provided wonderful sources, and this video would not be the same without them. So, hey, go give them a follow on Twitter. Check them out. All right, so what is the show exactly about? Ironically, I went from having very little context five years ago to having now way too much context. Yes, I was able to watch the series, but it's packed to the brim with exposition. Like, if I was to explain everything in this show in detail, this would be like a five-hour-long video alone. So I'm going to keep things to the point. Now, the premise for the series is actually quite simple. The army animals of Flower Hill, primarily squirrels, hedgehogs, and ducks, want to defend their home from the evil forces of the mice, weasels, and eventually wolves. They do so by sabotaging the plans of the baddies, or just straight up killing them with guns. Big guns. The primary characters of the show include, oh no, oh god no, I'm gonna butcher all these names. Uh, no, I tried folks, I sat at my computer and I tried to say the names correctly. I know the names, but I will just screw it up. I'm not good at saying names, even if I try. So let's just avoid it, uh, let's avoid that pain. I'm just going to call them by their nicknames, all right? Trust me, this is for the best and will make a lot more sense. First, we have Golden Squirrel, the main protagonist of the show. He's like the main undercover operative. He spies on the bad guys, tries to make the weasels and the mice fight each other, foil their plans from the inside, while also winning their trust. He, he plays them against one another. He's, he's pretty great. He's also like the most OC character of all time, where he's like, yeah, my character can do anything. He can fly a helicopter and also blow you up at the same time while also shooting a gun, but not piloting the helicopter. He's just that awesome. And there's also a, another squirrel character who's an operative, a striped squirrel. A very, very good friends with Golden Squirrel. Um, that's just that, you know, just just good friends. They're just very good friends. What are you ask? What, what, what are you trying to say? They're just friends. Shut up. So you got these two main protagonists, main spies, working to foil the plans of the bad guys. Then there's Brown Squirrel. He's the little brother of Golden Squirrel. We don't see him that much. He was going to join the military. He took a break. He's like a nerd. He became like super smart, but then he eventually would join the military. You know, he's a nerd, but he'll kick your ass. I'll tell you that. 
And then you got Hedgehog here, uh, who dies. Wait, no, not, not that one. No, that's that's the Commander Hedgehog. I'm talking about Scout Soldier Hedgehog, who dies. And then you got the Commander Hedgehog over here, base. It's kind of confusing because the show's called Squirrel and Hedgehog, but it's mainly about the squirrels. We don't really get too much of the hedgehogs. They're more of like the supporting cast. Then you got the Commander Weasel, Assistant Weasel, uh, the pissed off nerd mouse guy, Officer E621, and Commander Wolf. Uh, unfortunately, one of the drawbacks of the show, at least early on, is how indistinguishable the characters are. Because it's like, wait, which squirrel's who now? The golden squirrel has a little round, like, feature, little stripe on top of his, his head, on his forehead. And then, like, striped has a little triangle one at the top of his forehead. So it's like, oh, okay, that's how you tell them apart, I guess. It can be a bit confusing at times. And then for the weasels, you got, like, I'm the one wearing the bathrobe. I'm the one with the scar. I'm the one who's fat. And it's like, okay, they start to embellish it a bit more with character designs as the show goes on. But initially, it's a bit confusing. But ultimately, this show, what I've discovered, is just one big game of betraying, with like the villains betraying one another, and then getting betrayed themselves. Like the entire series is just essentially a, a long game of Among Us with the squirrel operatives being the imposters. I kid you not. I know that sounds cringe and corny, but that is the truth. You've been seeming sus lately. It's almost like we have an imposter among us. Squirrel and Hedgehog is mainly a story-driven show. Uh, there are 32 episodes in total, with the first one being released in 1977 and the most recent one in 2012. The first season, called Series 1, is from Episode 1 to 26, and ran from 1977 to 2005. Series 2 started in 2006, and ended on a cliffhanger in 2012, and includes six episodes. So I'm going to attempt to do an episode rundown to better explain the overall narrative of the show. I will absolutely fail at this. Squirrel and Hedgehog really is just that plot heavy, and my brief recap won't do it justice at all. But it will at least highlight the utter absurdity of the series. Let's begin. Episode 1. The squirrels are attacked by mice and weasels. Bear is drunk, so they trade him in for a tank and drive off their foes. Glory be to Flower Hill. Episode 2. The spying begins, and Striped Squirrel sneaks into the enemy's camp. He can't climb very good. Episode 3. A hedgehog stabs a weasel, and then a bunch of bad guys get impaled after skydiving. Episode 4. There's going to be a coup, and also the most badass 1v1 duel of all time goes down. Episode 5. There's a festival where the weasels want to be friends. The squirrels are sus of that. And there's a wrestling match for some reason. Episode 6. Apparently cameras can shoot darts, and Squirrel kills like 10 birds with his gun. Episode 7. Commander Weasel has a stroke because his plans aren't working out, and then Squirrel goes Rambo mode while using a car as a skateboard. Episode 8. Pocket Sand. Episode 9. Hedgehog commits Sudoku and actually dies. Squirrel cries like an anime outro. Episode 10. Squirrel drives in LA traffic and misses his home. Episode 11. Squirrel watches his boss get lit with his interns. Episode 12, boxing. Episode 13, the crows get blown out of the sky and Squirrel has to go back to spying, but he gets an anime hug first. Episode 14, Eye Patch Weasel is thinking about killing himself, but really he doesn't want to because Flower Hill still survives. He's got to beat them first. Unfortunately, Duck's not as lucky. Episode 15. Another animal festival with a skiing contest. Squirrel gets shot, but lives and looks a bit like Jotaro. Episode 16. More army games, and Golden and Stripe get caught being friends, and Golden gets kicked to the head. Again, they're just friends. Episode 17. Sea Lab 2021. Episode 18. Squirrel drowns a crow. Episode 19, public executions via firing squad. And then just five minutes later, a cheerful dance sequence with Golden and Striped. Episode 20, Mother Goose kills everyone. Just kidding, it's Duck. And Duck dies uh, again. Episode 21, Golden and Striped, who are just friends, share an intimate hug with really good animation. Episode 22, a robot who is not fucking around, and neither is Golden and Striped, who just go ballistic on some rats and weasels. Episode 23, Stripe fights a shark. 
episode 24. Another weasel wants to kill himself, but fails at it. Instead, he throws his boy into an electrified coffin? Sure, let's go with that. Episode 25. The giant enemy crab robot nears, but Striped blows it up. Episode 26. Flower Hill stops the weasels and uses their missiles on their own forces. Also, the main bad guy weasel gets blown up. And that is the end of season one. Flower Hill won! We won! Episode 27. Now Series 2 is here. We got Wolves, Tomb Boom, and 3D models. Episode 28. There's a robot whale, and the 2D models do not look good with the 3D models. Episode 29. A new evil weasel arrives. He has a scar. Episode 30. Golden goes back to the spy life. It just keeps pulling him back in. Maybe it's because of the mice maids. Episode 31. It's her! Oh my god, it's her! Wait. There's only two episodes left, and she's just now showing up? No! No, this is the worst show ever! Oh, and I guess Golden kicks the shit out of some wolf guards. And finally, episode 32. A bunch of child soldiers from Flower Hill kill adults while escaping from the wolf base, and Squirrel is still trying to stay incognito. Also, something about the kids potentially being, like, gassed because of some hallway they're in? Will they survive? Did the Flower Hill animals defeat the wolves? Well, it's been 10 years since we had this episode, so I guess they did die. Sure, let's go with that. Uh, folks, I honestly can't give justice to how packed the series truly is. Uh, my summaries are silly at best, but I can testify to how dense the show is with its characters, betrayal, drama, sacrifice, and violence. It is genuinely chaotic, both visually and thematically. As of right now, there's no official news on the series returning, which is a shame because I was kind of digging the new season with the wolves being the bad guys, and for no other reason in particular. Now, for those who want the full experience of this show, go watch it yourself. I highly recommend it. A link is down below in the description, and you'll find yourself just as confused and blown away as me. Come That's a little gay. Hold on. So now that I have more of an idea about Squirrel and Hedgehog, what are my overall thoughts about the series? In my last video, I had to fill in a lot of blanks, but now that I know why the Squirrel characters are undercover and why there's so much infighting with the weasels and mice, what does it mean? What do I think? It's a show about military espionage and sabotage and how these squirrels would beat your ass in Among Us easy peasy. What? I'm not the imposter. That rat is. Kill him. <laughs> 10 for 10. Admittedly, it's difficult to really settle into watching Squirrel and Hedgehog. Usually with most shows, I can eventually sink into the show's vibe once I understand what it's trying to do and let the experience wash over me for better or for worse. Getting lost in the world and the characters and only coming up for air when the credits roll. But this becomes difficult to do with certain shows, especially when the quality is so poor that immersion becomes impossible due to storytelling or technical blunders taking up too much of my attention. But that really isn't the case for Squirrel and Hedgehog. Now, the show isn't bad. It's competently written, decently animated, and the voice acting does a good enough job for the time it was made. There's nothing inherently terrible about it. When taken on its own, it's a pretty fun spy thriller, as our heroes constantly skirt the line in enemy territory to keep their friends safe back home. Classic stuff, right? But because of what the show really is, instead of being able to fully immerse in the story the show's trying to tell, my mind was constantly stepping outside the reality of the show and asking the question, what are they really trying to say? Because unfortunately, Squirrel and Hedgehog is jarring to watch through this lens. It's a kid's show, but deals with adult themes and depicts a very realistic level of violence and consequence. But unlike something like A Conqueror's Bad Fur Day, when it's done in a comedic fashion for adults, where the contrast between aesthetic and subject matter is the butt of a joke, Squirrel and Hedgehog isn't trying to make you laugh, it's trying to teach. Teach the youngest, most malleable mind some rather unsettling lessons. Always be on guard. Don't trust anyone not from your homeland. Everyone is out to get you and what you inherited. 
Conflict is a universal constant. Don't delude yourself into wishing for peace. The best you can have is security. Always be militant. Always be ready to defend what you have by any means necessary, even if you have to die for it. These are the tentpole lessons masquerading behind these cute anthro cartoon characters. The conflict between the denizens of Flower Hill and their enemies is never given any real exposition or context. Why is Flower Hill so valuable? Why do the weasels want it so badly? How did this conflict start? Is there any avenue for diplomacy? Nothing like this is ever really established. Flower Hill, North Korea, is paramount as a maxim and the threat against it is universal and unending. Relying on others is foolish. Take up arms and defend it. Kill outsiders without mercy or hesitation. The main characters of this children's cartoon are shown to violently shoot, stab, main, blow up, and choke the life of enemy combatants while a choir of children cheerfully sing songs glorifying the homeland in the background. There's a particularly notable scene in episode 3 where the hedgehogs stop a ground invasion from the enemy paratroopers by springing up a trap where the entire field gets filled with massive spikes and the show gleefully depicts the mice and weasels struggling to like avoid the, the spines and, and in vain they get pierced and skewered at Mortal Kombat style no less as the camera pans across a sea of dead bodies and it's very graphic. Like, it wasn't, like, bloody graphic, but it's still graphic nonetheless. But here's the thing. It's not the visuals themselves that are the disturbing part. It's why this scene was drawn and to whom it is intended for. Young children, captivated by animal characters who are suddenly being told that this is a fate befitting anyone outside of North Korea. Anyone not like them. It's incredibly difficult to watch the show as intended when this sort of metaphor translation is going on in real time in your brain. Most of the episodes begin with Squirrel and Hedgehog riding up in the tank to look directly at the audience and communicate with them, further endearing the children to these characters and their perspective by breaking through the fourth wall. By communicating directly, it builds a sense of rapport with these characters. It's a parasocial interaction, again, to better mold the minds of the young and impressionable to accept the totalitarian rule they will grow up around. Strong borders, militant isolation, and paranoia of their neighbors is what saved Flower Hill. So of course, our country should do the same. Now perhaps it's a bit hypocritical to get so bent out of shape over the psychological implications of this show. After all, you can make a strong case that there's all sorts of propaganda laden within multitudes of US-based entertainment. We all try to instill our values within the next generation. Uh, perhaps my reaction is more to the cultural difference and heavy-handedness of it all, rather than the concept itself. Maybe as someone growing up in the US, I'm blinded to our own blatant propaganda. Like, I've heard plenty of non-American friends of mine uh, just balk at things like the Pledge of Allegiance, and for good reason, too. But it feels just a bit more sinister here. Like, America is number one, certainly creates an ignorant, malleable population. But the lessons of Squirrel and Hedgehog, at least in my opinion, create something far worse than any apathetic consumerism in a viewer. It creates fear and paranoia. And of course, one can't ignore the use of furry critters and how they're the conduits for the show. Anthropomorphism is used very effectively to say everything without saying anything. Who are the enemies of Flower Hill? The mice and the weasels. Cowards who are underhanded and envious. Surely they don't represent any countries in particular, right? Then the wolves show up at the very end of the series. Big burly oafs who talk a big game, but get their asses kicked by squirrels nonetheless. I wonder if these powerful predators are symbolic of a world power. Hmm. But what I find interesting, though, is how the good animals of the show are critters who aren't really known for being powerful. Hedgehogs make enough sense, I guess, because of their spikes and how that draws parallels to defending yourself. And I guess ducks also make sense because they're the navy. But why squirrels? They don't strike me as particularly strong or militant. But maybe that's the point, that they're industrious, but they're also preyed upon by other animals. And that is why they had to soldier up. 
form an alliance of good animals with universally renowned traits against the bad animals like rats and weasels and ravens and wolves. Also, these characters are unsurprisingly drawn to garner appeal with viewers. Flower Hill animals have big eyes with big pupils and are more chibi, while the rats and weasels are beady-eyed with their sharp teeth. All deliberate. But don't think for a second that these cute animals can't kick your ass. I found a source with a quote from the vice president of SEK Studio, though it was from around 2005. It said, quote, that Squirrel and Hedgehog is a work that teaches children love. That some people say that this work indirectly depicts the current confrontation between Korea and the United States, but that is not the case at all, end quote. I find that hard to believe considering the heavy-handed symbolism of Squirrel and Hedgehog. Also, there was a brief spinoff comic for the series in 1991 called Brave Hedgehog, and the wolves in that series had USA printed on their helmets, so yeah. <laughs> I guess it's easier to kill enemies who carry heavy symbolism without having to flat out say who they are. And apparently, you could even do so in a video game too. Yeah, there was an actual game on Android for Squirrel and Hedgehog back in 2018, but apparently it has lost media. Let's talk about the show's animation. Originally, the show was a miniseries and was only granted more episodes later after the public demanded a continuation. Unfortunately though, the animation and art direction swings violently between seasons? Segments? Waves? <laughs> the seasonal partitions with this show are admittedly cryptic. The first four episodes were all produced at the same time. This was the original miniseries and the extent of the show's initial scope. The animation in these episodes is actually very impressive. The smooth motions and frequent use of animating on ones makes it punch well above what you'd expect from a show like this. Sure, there is frequent animation reusage, especially for weasels, but no more than most cartoons tend to do. The action sequences are also very impressive, with frequent use of things animating across the screen in perspective, motion from Squirrel that feels full of dynamicism and momentum too. There are a lot of animations for basic movements outside of the fight sequences as well, and of course a lot during the fights, all done at a flat profile angle. Not sure if this was done because it's easier to animate at a simple angle like that, or because they were using rotoscoping sometimes, which would actually explain all the animating on ones. And shooting references at a flat angle would be the easiest reference to set up. The first batch of episodes' biggest weakness, though, is probably just the general art direction. Nearly every character looks exactly the same as every other character of the same species, which can make the following scenes difficult when you aren't always sure who is where. This would probably be mitigated a bit if you're a native Korean speaker and the voices can help narrow that down. But between not speaking the language and the audio quality not being the best, it can be hard to tell the characters apart by sound alone. The second batch of episodes completely switched techniques, moving to an animation style with far lower frame counts, more in line with what you'd expect from TV animation. But the art direction becomes a lot more inventive and vibrant. Squirrel and Hedgehog both are slightly redesigned with brighter colors. The weasels have distinct outfits and visual accessories to tell them apart from each other now. The environments evolve from simple if beautiful paintings of forests and caves with all of drab military equipment to much more inventive and abstract architecture and environment designs. Flower Hill itself gets a lot more urban locations and actual architecture which helps ground the weapons and technology that seem to sprout out of nowhere in the original miniseries, along with playful vehicle designs that get a fair amount of screen time. It honestly feels like this batch of episodes visually was heavily inspired by Speed Racer, from the multiple car chase sequences and transforming vehicles to the general animation and character design. It feels like it's drawing heavily on the golden age of anime. The writing in this batch of episodes also gets more complex being a time skip after the conclusion of the original miniseries, with the main squirrel still undercover behind enemy lines. The story is actually pretty impressive for what is essentially a children's cartoon. Instead of the simple good versus evil sell toys that so many other cartoons would do, there's a fair amount of political intrigue, power struggles, and infighting as multiple factions inside the enemy group vie for power, and both squirrels struggling to stay incognito while reporting back to Flower Hill. Its ambition is surprisingly complex. 
And I found that this batch of episodes a lot easier to settle into and enjoy as its own thing. Uh, perhaps it was the campier art style that disarmed me more to the goings on. Starting with episode 25, the show transitions from cell animation to digital art, and the aesthetic evolves even further. Characters start having more detailed outfits, members of the same species have different color palettes and body types, and we even get some more complicated digital painted effects, like water. The switch to digital also lets them do more with panning and zooming for slightly more dynamic shot composition. But that doesn't mean we don't get the occasional animation error, though. Wait a minute! But overall, revisiting Squirrel and Hedgehog was bittersweet for me. I'm glad I had more context to better understand the series and truly sink my teeth into its convoluted but admittedly ambitious plot. Again, they could have just phoned it in with simple good guys versus bad guys tropey plot writing. But instead, we saw political and military intrigue with multiple layers to it. Uh, too many layers, to be honest. I genuinely don't know how kids can watch this series and follow what's happening because I actually struggled to keep up. That all being said, the entire show and any of its merit is undermined by the fact that this show is essentially weaponized anthropomorphism for the means of brainwashing children. Like, I feel dirty for liking and dissecting the series, knowing that it is actively being used as propaganda. But I can't help but be morbidly curious over the entire affair. On one hand, I wish the series did not have such a heartbreaking and turbulent influence that is curated by the tyrannical rule of a dictatorship. But on the other hand, would I be talking about this series if that wasn't the case? Would I talk about this series based on merit alone? Would it even be the same show without its dark origins? Who knows? But I can safely say that Squirrel and Hedgehog is unlike anything else in the world and is a very rare case study of the combined uses of animation, propaganda, and anthropomorphism to brainwash people. And if you talk shit about it, you better hope that Squirrel doesn't find out. <laughs> In conclusion, SEK Studio is one of the most unique animation studios in history. How it came to be, the strings that pull it, the content it creates, you'd be hard pressed to find another company that fits their mold. And for good reason too. Very few countries tread the path of North Korea when it comes to isolation. Relative to the rest of the world, very little goes in and out of the country. But somehow, animation persists. And that gives me hope. Now, I fully realize that said animation is flawed on many levels, and the means in which it is produced is concerning, to say the least. Korean animation studio! Everybody work! Ah. Everybody work! Ah. Everybody work! He big mean man whip us! It is very likely that SCK Studio is just a mouthpiece for the government, and for me to think that its primary concern is just art would be very naive of me. I mean, we're talking about a company that is guilty of exploiting its workers, dodging sanctions, and lest we forget, brainwashing children. Yeah, it's a bad look. But if there is any silver lining whatsoever, it is this, that animation is one of the very few arenas where North Korea teamed up with international entities. Once more, North Korea worked alongside South Koreans back in the mid 2000s and we saw glimmers of success through that joint venture, though it would eventually collapse due to rising political tension between the two countries. Nelson Shen, the founder and president of the Seoul-based Acom Production Co., is on record saying, quote, the first time I watched North Korean animation, I simply thought that if we tried our best, there might be a possibility to work together, but I had no idea North Koreans would turn out to be such outstanding animators, end quote. So, despite the turbulent background of SEK Studio, its questionable methods, and the government it answers to, we can at the very least acknowledge that there are talented artists in North Korea, and that its government at least cared enough to temporarily cultivate that. Now, for its own means? For a quick buck? Because Kim Jong-il wanted more cartoons to watch? Who can say? But for a fleeting moment in time, North and South Koreans teamed up in order to make a, a cartoon about an anthropomorphic penguin. 
Ah, move aside, Pingu. You've been replaced. And this brings me back to my other point. The universal appeal of anthropomorphic storytelling. Whether it's the ancient Egyptians worshipping their fursonas, or the North Koreans blowing up the enemies of Flower Hill, wherever you find humanity, you'll find anthro characters. It is truly universal, and it transcends all borders, beliefs, and even time itself. Now, admittedly, it's kind of uncomfortable how North Korea checks this box. On one hand, the writers and artists behind these shows are being controlled by the state and have been stripped of any creative latitude. But on the other hand, if you're going to make a propaganda cartoon, you might as well utilize the creative power of anthro storytelling, right? When I first watched Squirrel and Hedgehog, I only had a handful of translated episodes to work with. But based on the character designs alone, I was able to understand the motivations and the personalities of the characters. The squirrels and the hedgehogs are the good guys. The squirrels and the hedgehogs are united and brave. The rats and the weasels are underhanded and cowardly. And the wolves are the brutish predators. And all of this accomplished without saying a single word. Overall, it is a bittersweet situation for SCK Studio and North Korean animation in general. But if I can end this video on a somewhat optimistic note, it would be the following. One, that there is precedent of North Koreans opening their doors and the joint effort of pursuing animation. That they are willing to be diplomatic in this arena, which is incredibly rare. And then number two, that despite the drastic chasm that exists between North Korea and the rest of the world, that even though it is one of the most isolated places in modern history, they still share the very human desire of wanting to tell stories and do so via anthro characters. Yes, it is warped as hell, but it still shares that common denominator with the rest of the world. Mickey Mouse, Bugs Bunny, Bojack Horseman, and Squirrel and Hedgehog. And as absolutely cheesy, cringy, and naive as this might sound, that gives me hope. Hope that someday we can tear down these walls and see one another as humans who share a lot more in common than we realize. And ironically enough, through animals, hell, <laughs> stranger things have happened. You want to know why America and the Soviet Union decided to chill out when it came to making nukes? Because both sides said, hey, if aliens ever invade Earth, we would unite and fight as one. Yeah, true story. That's how it happened. So maybe, just maybe, a day may come when Kim Jong-un shares his persona on fur affinity and joins hands with squirrels, wolves, and foxes alike in anthro unity. Just imagine it. A squirrel plushie next to a private vixen plushie next to my own plushie. A man can dream.